another fantastic afternoon of, of even great, more great sessions this afternoon. So um, in here, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. James Zabrowski um, from the University of Hull, um, who will give you a presentation, Bridging the Expectation Gap, Career Pathways for Entrance to the Film and TV Industries. Okay, um, just to limit the risks of anyone feeling aggrieved that they chose this presentation, I'm going to mainly be talking about um, pre-university formal media qualifications, so think A-levels, BTECs, etc. This is, this is an accurate description of the projects as a whole, but um, Sheena was supposed to be here with me today, but unfortunately a family matter has um, meant that she can't be here, so I'm going to be kind of leaning it more into my particular area of the project. So if anyone wants to leave now in light of that information, I shan't be offended. Also, the, I don't know if the presentation will run to the full time, but I've never known anyone think, I really wish that presentation were longer. Um, so again, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it won't be too much of a problem. Okay, um, so just a little bit about the, the background of the project. I think it, it came from, um, I mean, I've been working at Hull now for uh, 13 years, uh, so I've sort of connected with, with the region and uh, the students that I work with at university. And obviously, uh, at, in that time, I've worked as an admissions tutor as well. So you kind of get a sense of the expectations that students come to university with. And obviously, part of that is the qualifications that they've undertaken before they arrive with you. Um, so what, what we were interested to explore further was some intuitions that we had about um, the expectations that young people have about work in the creative industries uh, uh, combined with the reality of working in those sectors. Uh, and my eyes were kind of opened through reading sort of national level research like the class ceiling, like culture is bad for you, which particularly highlights things like um, the precarity of working in the creative industries, which you've heard about repeatedly today and I'll be touching upon as well. Um, you know, uh, unopen nepotistic hiring practices, which are probably worse in film and television than they are in the game sector, for example. Um, so what we wanted to do was um, talk to young people before they arrived at universities about um, their expectations of what work in the creative industries would be like. Um, we wanted to talk to employers, particularly those who dealt with young people or people just starting their careers in creative industries. And also, we wanted to look at qualifications paperwork and talk to sixth form tutors and kind of triangulate everything. Um, now, Sheena has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the project, and she is the person who has been involved with um, going to schools, um, doing questionnaires, focus groups, etc. Um, yeah, up until today, I was expecting she would be here with me, so I'm not going to presume to speak on her behalf about that side of the project. Um, I'll, I'll show the slide at the end after I've spoken on my bit and sort of pick out some key points of that, but I'm not in a position to speak authoritatively to that element. Likewise, my other colleague, Laura, who, who can't be here today, she's leading on the looking at the employers part of it. So my focus has really been on um, looking at the qualifications paperwork and talking to sixth form tutors, because obviously the qualifications paperwork is a bit like um, biblical scripture that then has to get translated into reality by the, the people who, who deliver the material. So I didn't want to assume that just because it wasn't in the paperwork, it wouldn't be happening in the classroom. So I thought it was important, even though those interviews would be relatively small scale and regionally focused um, compared to sort of the national framework that's laid out by the qualifications, it was a useful sense checking exercise. And it also might highlight some specific things about the region. Um, I don't think the things that I found based on my reading around the topic, are specific to Hull, but they are specific to kind of not London, if you like. And what I mean by that should become a bit clearer as we go on. OK, so I'll just pick out some, some key things that, that I've sort of found so far. And some of this may be more interest to some than others, and hopefully there'll be something of interest for everyone. Um, so working at university, you, you kind of, obviously you're aware of the qualifications that come up on UCAS statements time and time again, A-levels, BTECs, um, as, as the two main sort of level three qualifications um, that you see very often. Um, 
So one interesting thing to learn from interviewing sixth form tutors was that another um, qualification that seems quite popular as an alternative to BTEC but kind of offered in the same spirit is the UAL qualification in creative media production, that's University Arts London. I uh, spoke to a few tutors who were switching from using BTEC as their qualification provider to using UAL um, because they said it provided a bit more freedom and, and it was interesting um, obviously uh, if, you've, if you've been in the game of being a sixth form tutor for quite a while you'll have seen a, a lot of sort of government interference. One thing that came up a few times was um, making the A-levels linear again as opposed to modular was not popular and also a sense that the media studies A-level curriculum kind of felt like they had to justify their existence the last time it was it was updated and plug in more um, sort of high level theory than was necessarily beneficial to all the learners who were who were on those programs um, so yeah the the people teaching the the qualifications would often be in search of things that would give them freedom to to deliver the program in the way that they thought was best for their students and some people thought UAL qualifications did that optimally others were thought that thought the BTEC did a good job of doing it as well um, there, there was generally in the people that I spoke to there was a sense of um, the A-level qualifications were, were one thing uh, and they were more theoretically oriented and the BTEC and the UAL and the CTEC qualifications were more were more practically oriented mm -hmm. but there was some pushback against the way that in some some providers felt that in BTEC sometimes um, process was being prioritised over product and it, it felt, one, one person I spoke to said it felt as though as long as you kind of ticked all the boxes of doing the production it didn't really matter what the production was so it was kind of this box ticking that didn't, it was also objected to because it didn't um, equate to industry practice so there would be a more intense level of storyboarding for example than you might experience in a, a quick on the fly production. Um, T-levels were something that, that came up. I don't know if anyone is, is sort of abreast of the, the T-level wave that is, that is coming our way. So T-levels are a new suite of qualifications that the government are developing that are designed to replace some other forms of qualification, uh, often, often BTECs. So there are already some running in some sectors. There's one in... I, I, Sorry, I checked the title of the qualification just before I came on, but I've forgotten it again. It's something like media and broadcast production. Um, that's due to come on stream in September 2024. Information on the government website is currently sparse. Um, it highlights some potential career destinations for people doing T-levels, but there isn't a specification or anything. If anyone has got a channel <laughs> to, to the T-level specification, please let me know because I'd be really fascinated to, to see. The big, the big selling point of T-levels, the, the kind of the thing that they're trying to do is to integrate more work-based um, placement time into the qualification. So there's a promise that students on whichever T-level they take will undertake a meaningful amount of work experience. You can also see on the website um, a kind of desperate pleas to employers, you know, please work with us. Um, we want because, and and this is this is a problem. To go back to the media specific thing. My speaking to the people that I've spoken to, the the anxiety is that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to create authentic, meaningful um, work placement experiences for the volume of students um, who they deal with. So, th this was something that that came up when we discussed um, careers quite a lot the the uh, the sense was uh, there's never enough work experience regionally to go around um, I'm not sure the situation is any better or different in in London or in other sort of really real places where there's a lot of production going on I wouldn't presume that but certainly across a lot of the UK it's the case that it's very difficult um, to find meaningful work experience for various reasons which which we'll probably all be familiar with and you'll be familiar more with some of them than I am. Um, some, some types of production, um, you know, production companies are very lean and they don't have the capacity to take on extra people. 
Uh, they might work on a project basis um, on very short projects. So again, you can't do it year after year. You can't set up the infrastructure so that you can, you can do it meaningfully, repeatedly. And the anxiety that was expressed by some tutors is that they would end up creating kind of semi-fictional work experience opportunities. This is something that David Buckingham wrote about um, about 10 years ago when he did a review of changes in um, post-16 qualifications that people would kind of, you know, it would be a client-based brief thing where it was the local hairdresser or the, the local football club. And I'm not saying there's no value in that. Um, of course, there is value in that and there are a range of different media jobs, but it might not represent or prepare some prepare someone for the kind of work in the creative industries that they are looking for. So T-levels and the broader issue of work experience um, is, is a real tricky one. I also learned during the course of the research something which, which I didn't know before, which is that um, there are these things called Gatsby, Gatsby benchmarks. I don't know if anyone's heard of these. So Gatsby benchmarks are um, designed to ensure or to try to ensure that um, schools and colleges have a good careers framework for their for their pupils. Having looked at the, the Gatsby Benchmark website, it kind of emphasizes things like individualized careers advice, um, a stable careers program, and connections between industry and schools and colleges. One of the tutors that I spoke to interpreted it as, um, or the way his, his institution had interpreted it was that they had to have at least one or two points of contract, contact between industry um, of various sorts and the students each term. Um, so getting representatives of various industries into colleges in front of the students was an important part of what they were doing. Um, I've not followed up yet to check whether there's funding attached to this as a separate item from sort of the block funding that education providers um, receive or if it's just part of their overall budget. I think that would be an interesting question. Um, so one of, one of the, the things that, that I was keen to establish, kind of a question that I had in my mind was, um, do any of the qualifications, uh, the main media qualifications that are on the table, do they um, make students aware of the working realities of the sector that they are seeking to enter? Um, the general impression I got is that the answer is largely no, um, with some, some slight exceptions. Um, and that, that understanding or that intuition was um, supported by subsequently talking to sixth form tutors about this. I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by this. So to go back again to the A-level versus um, BTEC, UAL, CTEC divide, what, what BTECs and UAL qualifications and the CTEC qualifications are good at is training students to be um, a kind of creative professional. So that involves technical skills, it involves project work, um, and it involves what, what we've been talking about today is employability. Now, just to kind of revisit the um, perhaps mini skirmish that, that we had, I think the employability, the employability as a, a noun it does place the onus upon uh, the individual learner to make themselves employable. So that's, that's the way in which I agree that it kind of functions ideologically. So rather than careers, which is a service which will help you find your way, it's kind of what are you going to do to shape yourself to be the person that the industry needs you to be. Um, now, of course, when, when you're working with young people with, with their whole lives ahead of them, I think you have to take into account what they think they want. And it would be silly and probably unethical to only make them think about the world that you wished everyone lived in rather than the world which we all actually do live in. So part of you, you have to help them to play things as they lie. I think that's part of your job as an educator. But also, I think if there isn't sufficient emphasis or any emphasis upon, um, you know, is this going to be the right career for you in terms of not just skills and how interesting it is to work in, but kind of the whole life contract that you sign up for when you enter this industry? I think equally that is a gap. So um, precarious working conditions, freelance working, long working hours, various forms of discrimination, nepotism, etc. I'm not saying these should be 
the only things that are taught. Obviously, they shouldn't, but I think there is more space for them to be included than they are currently. Um, on the A-level curricula that I've read, um, there is limited attention to these matters. It's slightly better on the UAL and BTEC um, structures because there are modules which are about life in the industry and the word freelancing comes up in the UAL specification. But there is quite a lot of scope for um, individual assessment centres to interpret the, uh, the curriculum within sort of the, the main learning outcomes that they have to um, achieve. So I think there is space and opportunity for there to either be um, supplementary support, kind of in, in the way that James is envisaging for universities, but for um, sixth form providers, or for, for the um, curricula to be revisited and for at least a little bit more attention to be paid to these matters. Um, because uh, as we've heard, you know, young people often, they don't think about sort of the, uh, the economic realities of, of the sector that they're entering. So equipping them with that information seems like the, the right thing to do, and especially for a qualification that is sort of pointing them towards the industry to do. Just, just one thing, one extra thing I'll say before I um, quickly go through, go through Sheena's points is, it's interesting the way the agency appears and doesn't appear in the, in the different curricula. In the A-level specifications, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on kind of the structural elements of this is how the media are because of think matters of political economy, etc. cetera, um, without much emphasis on this is what you could do as an individual agent working within the industries. There's not much sense of the day-to-day -day working practices of the media industries um, in the A-level curriculum. There is more so in the BTEC and UAL curriculum, but only in the manner of you know, being a worker rather than being um, an agent of change or a reflective practitioner or someone who has made a fully informed um, sort of in the round life decision about the, the sector that they're entering. Okay, um, just to show you, the, these are Sheena's points, which as, as I said, I won't presume to speak authoritatively to. Um, one thing that did, did come up that's, that was interesting in both interviews and in discussion was um, what I find interesting is that game design and, and media are often taught in parallel or in the same department. That's the same at my university as it happens. Uh, but it's kind of an interesting thing and, it, and there were differences that were commented on by the tutors about the way that um, people looking to enter industries like film and television versus those who wanted to enter industries like game um, sort of thought about the sector and and were making their first steps. Uh, in some ways it seemed more um, collaborative and democratic in, in game. Not that I want to over-idealise there, but it was an interesting sort of preliminary thing that came out of our discussions. Okay, I think I'll leave it there and hopefully there'll be some interesting discussion that we can have. teacher I found that really interesting so thank you for that um, whole presentation um, and it's less of a question and more of just an insight if that's okay um, and I, I want to just say before this that this is no way of me saying that independent schools need more privilege okay <laughs> so that's my, that's my <laughs> I work at an independent school and it was just really interesting to hear going through the different qualifications in media because UIL only offer their qualification to standalone six form colleges. So we've tried and tried to get that qualification in place of BTEC and, the, and we, we cannot get it because we're part of a, a, a right through school. Um, but what I found as a media teacher in the sixth form at this independent school is we're, we're in a bit of a sticky spot because we have a lot of armed forces kids in our school coming to with government funding who want a vocational course such as the BTEC, but we can't provide the T-level because we can't access the work placements that traditional uh, day schools would be able to because we're a boarding school. 
So it's really interesting to see where these qualifications are going. And, and again, like I say, it's not an audience that is often described as left behind, but there's pockets of students within that who are, are in those places for certain reasons who are getting left behind by all these changes in qualification. So it's just really interesting to see how that's going and what you understand about the A level and the expectation gap because essentially we have students who want to study media who can't and you know are grappling with that as as you have on every end of the spectrum. Yeah, no that is really interesting and I didn't I didn't know that UAL had that policy. Yeah. Um, so that's fascinating. The thing that isn't a hundred percent clear to me yet is what the T level is going to leave behind because I know there's been an almost compulsory phasing out or withdrawal of funding, which is effectively the same thing, for some qualifications. But for the for the T level one, I know that that Pearson and are worried with relation to the BTEX, but whether the UAL thing will will continue as a separate thing, because when you look at the 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 scant information on the T level site for um, broadcast media, it doesn't look as comprehensive as. Um, what the, what the BTEC qualification or the UAL qualification provides. It seems more, uh, yeah, more narrow. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone knows the answers to that yet. I certainly don't know them yet. But, but yeah, this, this is really interesting just to think about what's available to anyone at any one time. And um, just like for us, the pure logistics of getting everybody off, the staff in, the, like, the permissions, the consent, the health and safety of our duty of care when they're off site because they're out in our care 24-7. Yeah. To do T-level, the amount of work placements that are needed for T-level, it's just, it's, it's just not possible for us. So then again, it, it just comes into that restriction of, of like you say, what, what is left behind and what's there. Yeah, 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 definitely. I've been really struggling to form this question in my head, so I'll have a go. Um, where do you think the responsibility of, um, to mitigate some of this starts at level four when they go to university? Because it's one issue helping students understand the economic realities of the sector when they're at level three and they have to be there because it's compulsory. You then get to level four, they're paying £9,000 to be there. There's pressure to, show dem to demonstrate value for money for those students. But how do you navigate that responsibility around the economic realities against the fact that they're paying to be there and really want to tell them they're going to get a job? Yeah, uh, so in case anyone is watching at home, <laughs> uh, I'll just kind of repeat that question. That was, that was for uh, sort of what do you do when they get to university? Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this one because I've kind of got skin in the game here, you know. <laughs> It, that's and, and that's partly why I didn't want to research university level because I felt, what's that saying about, you know, it's hard to make someone see something if their salary depends on them not seeing it. Um, <laughs> but I think, I, I mean, this is kind of more of a personal answer than anything. I think you have to um, put serious effort into, you know, making sure that the students who believe they've, they've signed up uh, because they want to get a job in the film industry at the end of it, you, you do everything possible to, to make that, you know, to make it happen for them. So mentoring schemes, um, work experience where possible, pointing them to information, it's educating them about the realities of the sector, all those things as well as the practical provision. Um, so yeah, it, it is a tough one. And, and you know, I guess, I, I mean, I still believe in, in the value of uh, a university degree, it, it should both be preparing them for, for uh, you know, work in the sector that they want to go into, but also, you know, the value of a university degree is, is to hopefully foster transferable skills, um, a greater ability to enjoy many things in life other than work. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky balancing act. It, it certainly keeps me up at night. I imagine it keeps many of us up at night, but you just do the best you can, I suppose. Oh, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's one last decision to make uh, between two last amazing sessions. So um, in here, in the main room, we have Karen Merrifield from Innovate Educate, 
VIP Ketu from Ketu Studios and Lindsay Hebden from Great Place Lakes and Dales with their session, The Artery, Engaging Young People in Rural Areas. Uh, or if you'd like to move to the main room, we have um, Film Buddy, Bridging the Gap Between Education and Employability in the TV and Film Industry through Mentoring, Confidence and Live Experience with Shane Hamill from Emerald Sky Studios. Um, and they'll start again uh, in about five minutes' time, so if you want to move, please feel free to do so. And thanks again to everybody, James and everyone contributed. Thank you. So we have Karen, Lindsay and Verfi here to talk to you about archery, uh, which is um, around engaging rural communities. So Karen and I uh, first met a couple of years ago now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And we have funded uh, two of their cohorts uh, through the Innovative Training Fund, which was something that Sign wanted to support uh, so we could reach new audiences. Um, and it was around making sure that we were supporting networks that perhaps might not have been able to be supported before uh, through different training interventions. Uh, so they're going to talk about a variety of the different experiences and interventions that they run uh, through the archery and through great places and great great places, lakes, lakes and dales. dales. <laughs> um, so uh, this is our final session, so I'll pass over to you. So thank you very much, ladies. Hello. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, Lindsay Verpe and I are going to talk to you about well, we are very committed to the future being northern, but we're also very committed to it being rural as well. So um, I'm Karen Merrifield. I'm a heritage learning consultant, so I don't work in the screen industries. But I'm really interested in supporting young creatives to have sustainable careers. Um, Lindsay and Murphy, do you want to introduce yourselves very briefly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Lindsay Hebden, I'm the Programme Manager for Great Place Lakes and Dales. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in about three slides time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Virpi Ketu and I'm a digital artist and company owner in the rural area and also educator and uh, lecturer. And um, so much more. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. So I'll just catch up with the slides. So um, I've... I work as a heritage learning consultant, but I applied for a post with Great Place Lakes and Dells as a business animator, which I'm not really sure what that is, but it was looking at business in the sort of the Great Place Lakes and Dells area, but it's looking at how we could support creatives to have a, a, um, a sustainable career in, in, the, um, in that area. So today we're going to talk about the archery, which is something that both predates Great Place Lakes and Dells, but it's a legacy project as well. Um, that's taken off. Um, we're going to talk about the wider context of Great Place Lakes and Dales to set the scene and then we're going to share the, the learning around two um, interventions that we offered with funding from, well thanks to SIGN um, and we've got some really interesting outcomes from that. So Lindsay would you like to talk about yeah. Great Place Lakes and Dales for your sentence? Thanks. Yeah, so I'll just give you um, a bit of background to Great Place Lakes and Dales and a bit of key learning that we've, 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 we've kind of come through. Um, so Great Place Lakes and Dales, or GPLD as we like to call it, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, is a programme originally funded by Arts Council and National Lottery Heritage Fund as part of the National Great Place Scheme. It uses culture and heritage to connect with young people and ultimately help retain and attract more of them to rural areas. Those are the Lakes and Dales. Um, it's now been running for five years, believe it or not, um, the main national programme for four years and we've since followed up with smaller partnership projects including the Artery and we've recently ended a 12 month Arts Council funded nurturing creativity project which was focusing on young voices and representation but also creative careers. Um, the project's main aim is to amplify activity and voices of young people and continue to help develop um, a vibrant creative community um, that, of course, must be sustainable. The six original strands further to national research study that we did right back in 2018 into young people's perceptions to living and working in the rural lakes and dales were placemaking, which has now morphed into something called, we call spaces and places. Uh, that included a REBA competition in the original strand. Supporting the creative economy, again, young voices and representation. Digital growth, um, which is now very much centred on a marketing to young pe younger people campaign and project. Diverse programming, so co-creation and curation by young people. Um, Research and learning was a big thing. I think it's more learning and research now with a focus on learning. Many reasons. I think that 
sort of um, shapes our way for us, but also funding, you know, with research and things like that. And then business relations, which Karen um, has already said is the animateur of, uh, which we now kind of badge as creative careers. These have been delivered through a myriad of new business models, initiatives, creative projects, young people collectives, toolkits, events, and even festivals. Um, we had, for example, Hinterlands International Rural Film Festival ran in Skipton for the fourth time last weekend. Yeah, it was last weekend, um, which was great, really good fun. Um, these strands were led by four, as Karen's already told you, programme animateurs, as we originally called them when we re recruited. I didn't know what they were either, but they've done a great job. And Karen um, continues to lead on the creative career strand. Um, the Archery is a great example of a legacy project for Great Place, Lakes and Dales. There's too many projects to mention, but a snippet of them include a Creative Champions Network, Fresh Perspective and Folded, folded Zine, Young People's Creative Collectives in Skipton and the Lakes. Create Your Future, Digital Resources and Toolkit Showcasing Rural Creative Careers that Karen will probably tell a little bit more about. A Playwork Stay Residential, Innovate Your Offer, Cross Sector Creative Workshops and Watch This Space, which is in its fourth iteration at the moment in Skipton, which is 48 hour takeovers of rural spaces by creatives. There's loads, there's absolutely loads, but there's so many creative um, uh, words and terminology, you'll never remember them all. So lastly, learning. Learning has been a big part of our journey and continues to help us reshape our delivery to ensure that we have meaningful impacts. Um, so aside from navigating the many changes during the past few years, but also the ongoing changes and opportunities, because both South Lakes, who is one of the partners, South Lake District Council and Craven District Council, who I work for, are moving into a new larger unitary authorities at the end of this week. So that's a big, big change for us. But key takeaways from learning include patient investment and nurturing, focusing on process rather than outputs, very much a pilot. That's been about taking risks, so looking at the journey and the narrative rather than just are the outputs. Um, not just co-creation with young people, we need to co-develop. Um, young people are starting to be heard, but we need to do more at a strategic level to advocate for their representation. And we need to champion creative careers and young people as cultural leaders in their own right. Peer-to-peer -peer support, mentoring, coaching has been mentioned, and networking has been invaluable to them, as the artery is, is, is proof of. But above all, we need to listen to young people, and I believe that is one of GPLD's biggest impacts, as we provided platforms, both digital and physical, for diverse and creative expression of young people, many of whom advocate their love for living, working and learning in the lakes and dales. Our digital assets is so, so rich, thanks to the contributions of many, many young creatives. Lots from Verpi over there as well. Lots and lots, Dogsdales and all sorts of things that have come up. Anyway, I'll shut up. That's what I'm saying. It's not about us, really. It's about hearing from the young voices. So I'll let you hear from Juliet Clotrup, an inspirational photographer and filmmaker based in the Dales, who we have had the pleasure of working with several times. Pretty much unmatched. So much of what I do and why I make is so sensitive about where I live. My name is Juliet Clotra. I am an artist working predominantly as a filmmaker and a photographer. My job involves portraiture predominantly. A lot of the work I do is documentary. So I spend a lot of time with my local community trying to capture people's relationship between landscape and place. I feel like it's important to capture a local archive because these images will outlive us all. It's important to not overlook what seems ordinary. Actually, everybody has really extraordinary stories to tell. I use film predominantly in my camera or in my film camera. I've got 10 images or one reel of like a two minute film. So you can't see a digital version of that immediately. There's a bit more closeness to the subject because they can't then just alter their image or say, well, actually, I look a bit odd or whatever. It's as close as I can get to the image that I've just photographed in front of me. Youth of the Rural North was a project about young people living in the rural north in North Yorkshire and Cumbria. It was a film project, a Super 8 film, and then I took portraits on photographic film. I was really lucky that one of the portraits was a winner of Portrait of Britain with the British Journal of Photography. It was really exciting that William's portrait was in billboards in London on the underground for months. It felt really exciting to have a really important representation of rural life in Yorkshire 
being shown to the masses. Living rurally can be difficult. Like I'm very lucky to have access to a car. The challenges are isolation, and people are here. There's just just not in a condensed population. I've been involved in the Arteries peer-to-peer -peer support program, which has been a wonderful opportunity for me to connect with other small business owners. And it's been a great opportunity for me to be able to discuss the logistics of running small businesses. And although we've got different disciplines, there's so much relatability about doing that in, in this area. The last two years has given me an opportunity to sort of concentrate and solidify my practice. So now we're coming out of the time of, of turbulence. I feel as I've been able to really concentrate on the business side of what I do and sort of feeling empowered and owning that, yeah, I am also a business owner, essentially. I feel really positive about the future of what I do. I feel as though I've only just scratched the surface in terms of the things I want to make and I'm feeling more confident about what I do and, and, and who I am as an artist. I can't believe that in the last two years, having such a wobble about where am I going, what am I doing, I just get to make work here and yeah, lift up a stone and find out how many gems there are locally and how many stories there are. So um, Juliet is um, an example of somebody who's worked with Great Place Lakes and Dales, but she's also an example of somebody who has a, a rural business but is quite isolated. So that was part of the reason that we set up um, the archery, which... Um, are we OK to...? Yeah, it's coming <laughs> it likes to think about it. It is coming up. Yay. <coughs> so... Um, the archery is all about, well, quite a lot of the sort of conversations I've heard today sort of feed into this. It's a simple idea. It's about encouraging more creativity, more business and more culture. It's looking at how businesses can look at creativity as a business discipline. So they need creativity to innovate. Um, cultural organisations, I work in the heritage sector and cultural organisations have got great business skills but they don't recognise them as such. And they've also got a lot that they can offer to both creatives and to businesses. And then young creatives tend to have fantastic creative skills as you would expect, but either they are a bit frightened of business or they don't think it's for them. So. What we wanted to do was to set up something where we could bring them together um, but in a, a sort of a business programme that disguises business in creativity. So we use a story of change method to sort of deliver the whole programme. We talk about where young people are now, where they want to be. We also use action learning so that unlocks any sort of um, invisible barriers I suppose that they might be experiencing. And then we use creativity to actually address business skills. And an example of this, well, I can tell you about an example of that in the context of the two um, funded programmes. So we wanted, we sort of set up the, the archery in um, Craven with businesses, with sort of people who are mid-career um, people. But we then wanted to trial two programmes that used very specific creative disciplines to teach business skills. So we wanted to use AR and animation and we wanted to use screen storytelling and journalism. And we also wanted to target young people who wouldn't necessarily put themselves forward for business support. And that proved to be quite a tricky audience to engage, but we did engage with them and the results were absolutely fantastic. But the young people we're talking about are maybe, it's all, it's all euphemism, is it? The, the young people who would be the first in their families to go to university, so those from less affluent backgrounds. Um, and I suppose, as one of them said, the ones that get elbowed out by the bigger personalities. So those were the young people we wanted to work with, and we did get to work with those young people. So in terms of the screen stories, um, screen storytelling version of the archery, we ran a sort of a six six week program, um, and it was online. It was hybrid, so we had an in person session, but we also had these these hybrid sessions, um, and. Just to illustrate the, the, sort of the, the way that we used creativity to get them to think about their stories. So I'm sure you will have heard about this, but 
Ernest Hemingway is being attributed with the sort of the line that if a story is worth telling, you can tell it in six words. So here are a couple. The first one is a bit dark, I think. Um, for sale, baby shoes never worn. The next one is dad called DNA back. He's not. And then my favourite, which is a Margaret Atwood one, which is longed for him, got him, shit. So, <laughs> so we asked the two cohorts to tell their six-word story. We then sort of expanded it out so they had 50 words to tell their story. And we did it at the start and the end. And these are some of the stories that they told us. So Billy is a droll filmmaker who's passionate about realist storytelling. I know it's seven words technically. Um, um, and then this was Amy who is an, a creative advocate for accessibility within illustration. She wants to be a concept artist, but she has also got a diagnos diagnosis of autism, and she is really concerned about how people like her are seen in games. So she is absolutely passionate about that. Um, and we've got a documentarian who wants to share the diversity of Dale's life, and then an illustrator who we just thought, yes, yeah, she would be an illustrator, but she says she wants to be a creative cultivator. And what that means is she wants to create a space for other people to come into the Dales to be creative. So, and then this one that I thought is quite poignant, really, when you think about the people that we're working with. Couldn't work, couldn't leave, bought a camera. So, and that's from somebody who is in the Scarborough cohort. So, Verpi, do you want to talk about the AR and animation version? Yes. <laughs> so if I, I'll hand over to you. There you go. Good, excellent. Hi, so my name is Sirpi and I am very kind of in a unique position in a way that I was part of both. I was for Lakes and Dales and the Artery and I was a teaching this one um, so, and I have a business and I am a lecturer. So a bit of all sorts of aspects on this um, and thank you for Sign and, and for Lindsay and Karen for these opportunities. Um, so this workshop um, was for three weeks or so every Sunday and the idea was to um, show like there's been already here a lovely talk about the fact that there's really big gap of the latest technologies and the older users or even the new users so to introduce them to augmented reality and animation as a kind of a way to talk about themselves and their business and their creative um, endeavours. Um, so I would like you to uh, also to get a best possible experience. Uh, download this Artivif app if you want. Uh, this is Android and that's Mac. So um, uh, try, or you can just um, go to your app provider and put Artivif in it and get one uh, while I talk. So um, even if there was interest, uh, it came clear that people had travel issues also for this workshop and also social anxiety and it was common cause for not participating and we marked this on social media and uh, marketed this on social media and posters in schools and organisations. I also went to talk in a Craven College and it really seemed people wanted to come but uh, then they didn't, lots of them that looked like they really wanted to, but um, I think it's the social, these people grew three years in, in online, and so it's quite, quite a lot to ask to kind of come and participate. It's, it's getting better, but I think it's uh, still there. Uh, it's designed to address issues around the new technologies as an assist young uh, creative businesses as technologies are coming fast, they really are. I keep con constantly updating my information half a year basis, new software comes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's nice uh, to think about this as beneficial but not as like a, some kind of things to fight against rather. Uh, there is certain hesitancy to take also to, um, these techniques if you never really entered in the moving space image or the uh, image space <laughs> or the need uh, tech seems to be too expensive or elusive uh, but it's coming more accessible every day. In the future more information is going to be presented in AR, uh, all the information of products, um, uh, information services uh, that is already used in medical and all sorts of industries. Um, so 
the spatial recognition of our, our devices also uh, there uh, getting better. So it is coming whether we like it or not. It's uh, good to think about these benefits uh, to your own practice, whatever it is. So uh, we started with those uh, six word sentences. And for me personally, we also had in this workshop was um, uh, we did dream boards. And that was really kind of the pivotal moment of people realizing what did they actually want and what did they not want. Uh, this is very important to know what you don't want. Um, I wonder, hey, uh, you can already, if you have the RCV app, you can test this one. This is Billy, uh, and he was the droll filmmaker passionate about realistic storytelling. So this is how he should launch from the, if you have opened the app and then just point that camera into it. This should do something, I hope it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, please say if it does. <laughs> Does it work? I really, really hope so. Good. <laughs> huh? What are we supposed to do? So open the RCV app in your phone. Yeah. And then it should have the RCV app. If you point it at this image, it should launch an animation that he did. So we used, oh, patience, patience. It could have lots of things, your device, your memory, or connectivity. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yes, we need, we So, I also they used a stop motion studio, which is so accessible. You can do very quite high quality stop motion animation. This is done uh, with the pieces animating, and then with the RTV app, it the animation was uh, linked to this image to launch the animation. So it could be anything. It could be a soundtrack. It could be just information. It could be text. It could be a video. So. Mm -hmm. This imagining if you had a t-shirt design or, or even just a, your business card and you add this to it, to, people will remember you like this. <laughs> <laughs> so there is lots of benefits. And then uh, everybody okay with that? And this is uh, Ruth Kitty White Productions um, and she was documentary and showing the diversity in Dale's life. Um, is uh, finding his logo and in mm -hmm. identity and uh, this can be used with all for her promotion and message video information can change the update any time too. So there's lots of these accessible apps. RTV is just one AR um, app that you can use for free to a point uh, and the <coughs> motion studio is free to a point and then there's quite a portable version. Uh, of to making anything, you can animate anything basically. I'm an animation professional for 20 years, I should know. Uh, so, um, yeah, so overall, everyone left the workshop somehow changed, myself included. Uh, it was interesting to see the change and the um, willingness to have a, a business in the rural area, and the self employment is in a scale as it first seems. If you have support, like from Sign and from uh, Artery and from Lakes and Dale, so it's good. And it was also much fun. Thank you. Yeah. So just to sort of, um, sum up, really, we learned quite a lot from working with this cohort of young people. In fact, I'll catch it with my slides. Um, a lot of them are pioneers in their families, as we said. They're the first to go to university, but often they will hit a wall when they come home because they don't have that infrastructure, and particularly this cohort with COVID. Um, and they're facing a lot of common issues, and action learning was really helpful in that because some of the issues that people brought, they were quite sort of nervous to bring those issues, but they realised that they faced everybody or everybody was facing them. So the main thing is... Um, physical isolation, we've talked about social isolation, but the physical isolation, just so few creatives in that area. Um, there is no really medium or large sized businesses where they can get a sort of first foot on the ladder. And so they're actually setting up businesses as a way of getting a portfolio together so that they can take that to businesses to actually get employment. So, and they're doing that without the sort of the skills of knowing how to, to create a business. So that's what we were trying to help them with. So to just go through the basics of setting up a business. Um, most of them were subsidising their creative work with um, poorly paid jobs. So a lot of them are carers 
or they are um, working in catering and one was getting up at four every morning to milk cows and then milking them again at six, um, which I suppose is quite unusual, um, for, but not in this community. They also talked about access to networks and um, equipment and I think one of the big things for them was about how to be visible, how to be visible in a world where everybody's visible, but how they can be visible to the people who are likely to want to work with them or employ them. And a lot of these young people are award-winning, so they've done absolutely the best that they can, but it's those connections that they're lacking. So these are some of the, the comments. They told us that they, um, well, they had more confidence in their abilities. Um, they had a network, a supportive network, which is ongoing now because we're, we're um, meeting with the archery every two months in Skipton, but often we're offering mentoring as well. Um, and they've got a, a plan of how they will approach their career and look at where they want to be. They know where they want to be, so it's putting the steps in place to get there. So they've got a much clearer idea of what they want to do. So as far as we're concerned, um, call to action for us is we want to run more of these programs but we also want to make connections and I was really interested in the, the conversation with um, Screen Yorkshire so sort of connections to businesses who can provide paid commissions to these young people so they can hone these skills I mean one of the things they were saying was they don't know how to speak to businesses so a sort of almost protected oops, sorry, um, commission where they're working with mentors is will be helpful to them in getting to the next step and I suppose a sort of call to action to the group here is um, we're talking about six word stories so can you um, sum up your six word story of how you might be able to reach out to or help these young people thank you Well, we're, we're running um, another six sessions, but we're meeting every two months. And that, again, we're using action learning, but we are uh, we're just sort of planning the programme. So we've got somebody coming to talk, an actor coming to talk to them about presentation skills. We've got an accountant coming to talk to them about the really sort of essential business things. But we've just got a programme of things that are led by the group that we've set up. But we do want to offer more programmes with a sort of intense six sessions and mentoring and they can then join the wider archery network but I think our next step is to go from working with the creatives to working with the businesses and then looking at how cultural organisations can also support both sides. So. Sorry I, I missed the very beginning of it, where, where are you based? Um, well, <laughs> Great Place Lakes and Dales is from um, Skipton up to Grasmere, so it's the A65 corridor. Okay, yeah, and yeah. Area, well, we ran two um, cohorts with the funding from Sign, and one was in Scarborough. But we found that because people were working in sort of part-time jobs, it was best to <coughs> offer online. So we offered sort of twilight sessions. So we offered six of those, and then we ran an in-person session, which was brilliant. You know, we had a group of really quiet young women who were all having this brilliant tech talk that I don't think you would get you know, if you didn't create that environment for them. So, um, yeah. Do you run anything else elsewhere then? Was that the main focus area that you, you're in? Because you run other schemes, don't you? Yeah, well, well, I suppose with Great Place Lakes and Dales, there's quite a lot of different things that we've, we've put in place. So there's Innovate Your Offer, which was something that we ran where we did bring together businesses, creatives and cultural organisations. And that was with an idea of um, introducing creatives to cultural organisations who could help them with maybe funding bids so they could work together on projects but also to introduce them to businesses as well. So the, and, and there was the, the um, commissions as well. We did seed funding through Great Place Lakes and Dales so we had five and ten thousand pound commissions for either people who wanted to work with young people or for young people to develop their practice. So there's quite a lot of different things that are in place but yeah. And when we are first Talk up here because I can't the microphone thing. But we are, um, as I say, just to emphasise, I'm employed by Craven District Council, which moves into North Yorkshire, the much bigger Unity Authority. South Lake District Council, which is one of our partners for Great Place Lakes and Dales, moves into Westmoreland and Furness this weekend. 
So I, th I think it's kind of watch this space, I don't mean the project, but it's widening our reach in some ways. We don't know how that will work or how we'll deliver that, but the moment, we, the, those borders are very fuzzy, as we call them, because young people, young creatives, are, you know, we work across. We've just done a focus group in, in Leeds and one in Manchester. You know, we work in cities as well, so it's kind of a wide reaching. And a lot of the, the creative careers work that Karen does is, is trying to encourage them to take them across those areas. So a bit of change at the moment, but I see the opportunities, so hopefully, for younger people. And Verpi and I are both freelance, so we sort of are looking for funding or looking for ways to make this work because I think it's, it's really needed. But it's sort of, it's coming from young people upwards rather than the other way, saying you should be doing this. It's, we've identified a need. And, and also, a, a great thing about Great Place Lakes and Dales is things that were started five years ago, and now young people are running those, and they are in control of that, you know, and that's how it should be. They are becoming the advocates for themselves Absolutely, rather than yeah. as sort of facilitating that. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for lasting this long. Triple bonus points to you all. Um, and thank you so much for giving your time today to attend the Future is Northern Skills and Training Conference here in Leeds. It is my honour to be giving the closing remarks. It's been an absolute pleasure to organise this hybrid event on behalf of XR Stories and Sign with grateful support from AHRC. We're still here, thank you. Um, many thanks to the team. Um, Alex, Pip, Jude, Sophie, John, Nicola, Sue, Livy, Charlotte, Wendy, Emma and Nina, plus others who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this a reality. And a huge thank you to all of today's contributors and contributions who have offered such valuable insights into the challenges of supporting skills and training in the creative sector. When the world continues to move at a frenetic pace and our audience and students' needs are ever-changing, there is a lot to consider. So much so that I've written it all on my phone as we've been going around. So <laughs> I would try my very best to sum it up. <laughs> so we've discussed the future of the screen industries and how we might equip um, the creators of the future to make it. We've explored the, near, the need for cle clear. No, let's start that again. We've explored the need for clear signposting, which is really hard to say, um, for training and skills provision not only for those wishing to enter the creative industries, but for those who continue to work within the sector, and not forgetting CPD, Continuous Professional Development, for those actually delivering the training provision too. We continue with the challenge of the screen industries to be more inclusive and accessible. We need to keep working. I'm sure you all have many takeaways from the conference today. I've got so many. But I, I've tried to just distill it down because I know you're all keen to leave. Um, just to three <laughs> core themes. Creativity, inclusion and access. And our new phrase of today, critical optimism. So creativity. We are a creative industry. We support creativity. We shouldn't be afraid to support experimentation and ambiguity. After all, we don't know what the job of the futures are but we can be sure that creative thinking will be part of it. Formal education from early years onwards should have the space, time and resources to support our young people to be active makers. Inclusion and access. How can we be better at inclusion? Cassie Kill said, we understand the value of diversity schemes but recognise there is still much work to be done. Shirley Vanter said, this is great. Diversity is not a day course. We should keep the door open. Access. Access in so many ways. James Zabrowski said, we need to understand the importance and need for authentic and meaningful work experiences in local areas. And Beth and Jones said, we need to continue to develop and signpost training frameworks to help everyone know what's out there and available. And Shane Hamill just said, we need to give young people self-belief to have the confidence that they can work in this sector, 
and give them the skills to be the best version of themselves, that they are entitled to be here and they should be proud of who they are and what they do. And finally, critical optimism. <laughs> As skills providers, how can we be the agents of change? My goodness. How can we balance the needs of industry, the expectations of students, and the skills and resources of training providers? I don't have the answers, but we will approach the future with criti critical optimism. Thank you.